coming to you live from downtown Detroit. This is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've bitten a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. Lots of news on today's show. Uh, earnings, of course. Ratings, of course. Uh, some other news as well. Bill Ackman taking a stake in Agilent. We've got uh, Sanofi maybe selling their share in Regeneron when they're able to next year. Norton LifeLock uh, potentially merging with a, or getting acquired uh, by a peer. That's moving uh, on that headline. We had some strength in retail yesterday, so we'll talk about that. Uh, retail sort of leading into the, the holiday season here. Uh, and our guest today is Eric Kroll from Kroll Asset Management. He's also the author of the, or co-author of the Lifecycle Trade. Uh, Going to give us a little bit of a year in review in the IPO market. That'll be at 8.35. Joel, what's the word here overnight? Got some red on the screen here, Spencer, down 11 and three quarters handles at 31, 22.75. We closed yesterday, got a little pop just above your daily pivot, 31, 38.75. So there's your target on the upside of getting any kind of rally and have to go through Tuesday or Monday's close as well at 34.50. On the downside, we hit 16 and a quarter. And uh, that was just below your uh, your Globex low from Friday. So levels looking good this morning. Got a little bit of a bounce. So uh, holding that 3116 low, very important. Uh, if not, we could fall closer to 3000. Uh, crude down 37 cents here at 58.65. Gold up 670 at 14 at 71.60. Silver up 7.3 cents at 16,750. 15 Bitcoin up $50. That's the future. 7,370. Also, folks, I just want to alert you today will be the last month that the front month contract will be December. They'll be doing the roll. I believe the rollover is tomorrow. So uh, changing contracts will be equal volume between both. Uh, but be a little choppy. I think you'll see choppy sessions really till the end of the week until Everyone switches over to the H March contract. Triple D, how are you doing uh, on this Tuesday morning with the red market? Are we red enough? We're red. I'm I'm not working on my stream on premarket.benzinga, so I don't know if you enabled it, Spencer. Yeah, we're Gremlins up. here this morning. We're up. Okay, because I, I don't have it at all. Can uh, the stream? If I refresh the pages, it's not showing up there at all. So. Well, we're um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's on my end. Anyways, in the live chat there at the Benzinga page, can you guys let us know if you hear it? If you do, say yes. If you don't say anything, we assume you don't. Jamie, uh, but I'm not I, seeing I'm, anything I'm there. telling you, I'm telling you, we're up. So. He's that's looking weird. at. It. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Must do you see it? You see it working on the Benzinga page too? No, Here. it's not working there. All right. Well, let's no try. So, I think Spencer. I think you're wrong. I don't think it's working there. Well, no we're, up on, you, we're up on you. We're up on you. We're up on you. We're up on YouTube. YouTube listeners are always good. The, the right. pre pre market. Do so if for you YouTube listeners, we have another with our main page where we broadcast this from is pre market dot com. There's a live chat going there as well. So if you ever want to come visit us over there, more than welcome to. YouTube listeners are up. We got to get it going for our main page there. So Spencer's going to work on that in the background. While we talk about the markets here, and yes, we do have a little bit of a sell-off here this morning, a little bit of follow-through from yesterday. So we talked about this 315 area. We talked about it in the pre-market, Joel, and I asked you even specifically about you know this 315 area being resistance. Well, you know what? We got up to there again yesterday morning, hung out there for a, a good part of the morning, but then started to leak. And then we continued to leak all day. Now we get the overnight sell-off. So that 315 level isn't a triple top anymore. It's now a quadruple top. Yep. Major, major, major resistance on the SPY up at 315. We come off that fail there once again. That's concerning. 
Yeah. Now, also, when you asked me about that, I told you about the Friday, Monday move, the Friday, Monday momentum and how we had got all the losses back from last week and a strong close on Friday. Great unemployment number. How it was very important to continue up to that area and actually take that high out and keep on going. I got a little bit, you know, I got through the pre-market high just by a tad enough to get me a little bit bullish, but I had, you know, I played it tight and, uh, you know, was able actually to end up getting a short off after that when that area failed. So uh, resistance is resistance until it's broken. Uh, you have a Fed meeting uh, tomorrow, Fed decision, uh, a lot of different things going on. But right. You got a great resistance point, And if you want to reset from Friday, we did take out Friday's low, not by much. So jump over here in the individual stock movers this morning, and it's going to be talk a lot about Netflix here because we have a major downgrade coming in. Spencer Israel, give us the details. Another downgrade, not just a major one, another. This is now the third downgrade from Netflix in the past, I guess you want to call it three weeks here. Uh, this morning, Needham downgrading Netflix to underperform. This is off the backs of a Citigroup downgrade on December 3rd and a Wells Fargo downgrade on November 25th. So the analysts are ganging up here on Netflix. And the good news is that the last time Netflix got downgraded, they shrugged it off. The bad news is that this stock is now under 300 bucks and 300 is a critical level for it to hold. So I think if you are bullish, you need to see it get back up over that 300 in a hurry because the trend is now starting to get, and if you don't, and just take your Jeff Mackey purple crayon and take the lows from September, October, November, December, you start to get concerned that potentially this trend is going to start to be in jeopardy too, this little uptrend of, as of, of recent. They're projecting, I'll just read you from the note, we project Netflix, this is the Needham note, we project Netflix will lose 4 million US subs in 2020 at its premium price tier of nine to $16. We believe Netflix must add a second lower priced service to compete with Disney Plus, Apple Plus, Hulu, CBS All Access, and Peacock. We've been talking about the competition coming. That is exactly why Needham is downgrading this morning, each of which are 5 to $7 per month. Since Netflix's balance sheet cannot withstand lower revenue, in our view, we recommend a six to eight minute per hour ad load to supplement a 5 to $7 month consumer fee so they're trying to tell them i guess how to fix it but in any regard here they're putting um their price target down there um where is the price target 260 oh i didn't actually see that i think i don't know if that they talk about a 260 price i'm not sure if that's the actual price target they came in with so anyways they're talking about bottom line they're talking about competition coming they're talking about their product netflix being uh more expensive which I, I, we've never talked about that on the show being more expensive than the competing products so I will tell you just from personal experience, if you have kids, the Disney Plus is a superior product. If you are 20 years old or above and don't have kids, um, I think you're probably still going to Netflix. I don't think Disney Plus is as much of a threat. But since we got Disney Plus here, the Netflix doesn't even come on. Um, so there's actually, honestly, you know, I'll watch a little bit of the Netflix. But for the kids, they don't even want to go to Netflix at all. They just want to go to Disney Plus. So for kids, the Disney Plus is a superior product, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, you get over and I get, you know, if you're 20 or 25 years old, you're not worrying about the Frozen movies and all the cartoons and, you know, all the friendly content that Disney has. So, you know, that, that's where I'm at. I, you know how I've said, if you listen to this show for a while, I've said for a long time, I think Netflix is eventually under a $200 stock. I looked pretty good when I made that call at 330. I looked pretty good when it went down to 250s. It's come all the way back up to where I originally made that call. So I don't look as good now, but I'm sticking with it. I'm bearish Netflix. Interesting uh, price action here. Uh, you first, you had an immediate spike in the uh, in the trading and it went to, where did we go to there? Like to 288.98. And then you've popped up and just real quiet, real quiet consolidation here. And what I'm looking for, I got resistance here at 296. You're trading just under that. So get above 296, you might get a little pop here. Uh, do not think you're going to see the uh, the low of yesterday's range. I don't think you're gonna. I don't think you're gonna see this one bought like the other one. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, if today or the next couple of days you get up anywhere near 302 and a half, those were the lows on Friday and Monday. 
lay I'd be very tempted to lay out some shorts at that area. On the downside, I mean, you had that spike low, so it may be protected. On the daily charts, you have a daily low at 287.57. So, I don't know. It's weird to have that spike and then be right back up. But if I was waiting for, for a good solid short that I could hold for a while, might try and hold out for that 302. And um, on the downside, a nice target today. You haven't taken out that November 15th low at 87.57. Again, we know there's a problem on the Benzinga page. Another uh, people are saying the show right, is not I, up. It is I'm on YouTube. Dropping, I'm dropping it. Well, they can't hear me, so it doesn't matter. But if you, yeah. go, if you go what's to the going chat, on with that? We've never not sure, but we're up on that. YouTube, so we're still rolling here. Yeah, too high. We, we've got everybody watching on YouTube here still. So this goes direct to the YouTube channel. Benzinga, if you, if you, if well, obviously if you're hearing it, you're hearing it. So I guess it's pointless for me to say it. Exactly. So, so let's okay. just move on here. Um, we've got some earnings we can go to, or we can talk about. Uh, actually, yeah, let's go to the earnings. Yeah, let's do the earnings. There was yeah. a couple big ones from last night. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll start with Stitch Fix. Yeah, big pop. It's the biggest uh, gainer on my up filter this morning here. Uh, they reported after the close yesterday. Q1 EPS uh, flat, $0.00. They were supposed to lose $0.06 cents a share, so that's a beat. Sales, 444 versus 441 a million dollars. That's a beat as well. Active clients, 3.4 million, and that's up 17% on a year over year basis. It's a nice pop. I remember, and I'm trying to remember which quarter it was, Stitch Fix having a huge pop on earnings. If it wasn't last quarter, it was the quarter before. I know. Maybe was. Spinner can help me out with this, but I remember, remember having the big pop, and it was up like 10% pre market and a closed oh. red. So I don't know if history repeats itself here. I'm just saying this: we have history that this has had a good pre-market before and then turned around and gave it all back. So if that concerns me. I never like buying stocks that are up 10%, especially in stocks. And obviously the trend, you know, is starting to break here. But, you know, we're still looking at stocks that was $50. It's still an overhead supply issue here as well. So, you know, just ignoring all that and just saying the history here, we've seen these rallies faded before. And I'm just uh, scared to buy it up here. I don't know if I'm necessarily shorting it, but I'm just saying caution to the person who's buying it up Go here. back a little bit farther on your dailies. Go back to the middle of July. I know what you're talking about, Dennis. I think Do that's you remember that? Yeah. Was it the stock in the 30s or something? I thought so. And, yeah, then, and then it, it really popped up. And we got up like 32. And we ended up closing red that day. Like it gave the entire huge pre-market gain back. That's my concern. What are the uh, what, what's the prior earnings date? Do we have that up here? I do in my pro. yeah yeah we can look it up in pro real quickly for Stitch Fix. Yes, it wasn't last quarter. You won't. You may not even see it on the chart though, Joel, because the problem is yeah it wouldn't be last quarter because of stock price. I remember it being in the third. Maybe it was two quarters ago. We maybe it was two quarters ago. The July the, the June fifth report is that what? You're yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah, I remember it popped. Remember, it was up like ten percent. It was up like three, four bucks in the pre-market. Yeah, and it that... turned around. I was like, I was my jaw hit the floor when I looked at like eleven o'clock in the morning, and it had went red. I was like, wow, did that ever turn? No, so, I don't and... know what it was. I know what it was. Go when? back. I found it. Uh, it was actually March. <laughs> was it three quarters ago or two? Yeah, it was that long ago. Popped to thirty. It, here's the close. It had a close at twenty six ninety eight. Yeah. Hit- 37.72. It still Holy closed. Mackerel. It still closed green on the day. It closed at 33.78, but you never even saw that closing. It price. gave a lot of it back. The following day, you know, if you use that closing price as oh, I'm going to get out at the close, you never got out because the next day's high was 33.50, and then it was straight down, filled the gap, and then some. So there you go. There's your the point is, you know, and obviously in my style of trading, I like to look at history. What is things? What have things done in the past? The point is we've seen rallies faded before in stitch fix. So that is just the concern. Again, if I, I don't know if I'm necessarily coming in because you have room. I mean, this thing's basically, if you're just looking out to the weeklies, there's not much in here at 27 and a half. I could see room to 30. I could see like how you could get yourself in trouble by shorting this. And that's why I'm not coming in here and shorting it, but I'm not coming in here buying it either. So this is one of those wild pitches or, you know, curveball they're throwing. Yeah, it may look good when that leaves the pitcher's hand, but it's going to slide way the hell out of the strike zone. And I think it's a difficult pitch to hit. Yeah, just try and foul it off maybe. 
What's going on now? We're rallying. That's I hard, know, man. Do you know that there's a statistic that um, in in professional baseball, someone told me this the other day, that like almost eighty percent of full count pitches are foul. They end up being foul balls. Did you ever hear that statistic? What's the stat again? Give it to me again, because the market's running around. It's got me. Uh, we are rallying. I noticed it just that that on a full count, eighty percent of the next pitches are, are foul balls. So how how does this relate to the market here? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like. I'm just saying it's a hard pitch to hit. Yeah, yeah okay. very hard. Right. So I'll hard tell you. Oh, I said that Dennis just fouled it off. That means you don't. Know okay. Not. You're hey, right, Spencer. That's fair. Though. No, that's fair. I get one demerit. No, no. I think I think you I think you saved it. You saved it there. All right. We are rallying. I don't know why. We just popped up three or four points. A fifteen, and though I've got to assume there was some type of number. Yeah. Oh, I don't. Whenever you see eight fifteen rallies, usually it's some type of economic. I, honestly, they're usually the numbers that only move the jobs report. So I used to have my economic. We I trade years ago. I had the economic <laughs> calendar already. Oh yeah, we're gonna get this number, this number. Remember, even when we started the show like six years ago, we used to talk with the other numbers. Industrial production. And we don't talk about them anymore because they hardly move the market. So you know they seem to be non-events. Everything except the jobs number. Sometimes GDP. Sometimes the ADP yeah. moves it a bit. But the jobs is really the number. That's the number that's always moved the market. It used to be that back before you were probably born, it was like the money supply. Everyone watched the money. You no know, one even looks at that yeah. now. Yeah, no, no, it's like, yeah, it just it gets bigger every day with the Fed. Uh, <laughs> that's we're, true. We're, we're, we know where it's going. We're mid-range on the session, so that's important to recover. So that's an area. All the way back to Stitch Fix here, I'm looking at this $28 area. And the reason for that is if you go back, I think it was just a – Go back to July. Look at all those pesky highs right there uh, in the 28 area, flanking 2771 up to 2823. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight highs in a row. So that would be a target for me. I would try, you know, at least if I, you know, was bullish or long this, I'd see if I could get lifted at 28. And then I think, you know, things really open up. But if you don't, if you can't clear that 28 in that first bracket, uh, you may get a little little bit of appeal back here in Stitch Fix, but good number to look at. Has not hit it yet in the pre market session. Let's also, talk- last night report. I want to do Chewy. Yeah, that's where I was going to go next. Actually, uh, Chewy reported uh, Q3. Let's pull the number up here. EPS to, uh, twenty cent loss versus a sixteen cent loss estimate. Sales one point three two versus one point two billion dollars. So a slight sales beat to go with that EPS miss in the quarter. Um, did they give guidance? I don't see guidance oh, real quickly here. Just give me a quick. Start. Dennis, I hope you got out near the open yesterday. I sold the open. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Um, and the reason was because I just had it overnight because a lot of times they get bid the next day and they, um, and they bid it right up. It opened up 50 cents. So it's a pick on a day we were opening. I think we were opening red. Were we not on the S and P? Uh, we weren't up. We weren't up we much. Opened, if we, were yes. up. We, we opened down. We opened down. We had a 40. Yeah. So, you know, just like I'm you know, looking at the herb too and just saying, you know, and, and also yeah, the, the, the previous day's high was concerning to me as well, which it matched yep. perfectly. Oh, so, yeah. you know, there's, there's multiple things we look at, you know, and we do the same thing and you can tell we're creatures of habit, you know, and traders are creatures of habit and I am like the biggest creature of habit. So I always look, you know, okay, well, we're trading up here. What was yesterday's high? And if we start to look like we're going to open right at yesterday's high, I'm a little bit nervous because if we open yesterday's high and start going down, now you got the little double top we talked about in place. I know technical analysts that are longer term swing traders say, what are you talking about double top? We talk about two tops in a row, not looking at longer term swing trading. I'm a day trader, you know, and, you know, obviously we look to the longer term 90 day chart to get feel for where different levels are. But when I see two highs in a row or two lows in a row in the same area, I note it because a lot of times they move from those areas. And you saw CHWY. The other thing that spooked me, which, you know, I did not know about before we started talking on the show and the chat alerted us to, I think it was Spinner, was saying that the lockup expiration was there uh, coming. And I did not know that either. And I was long the stock and I'm like, Um, you know, with that coming too, that spooked me as well. So anyways, it ended up working out. I got out just in the nick of time. And it'll you a little is bit. Is that lockup expiration today or tomorrow? It's today, um, isn't it? I actually hear that. I again, I wrote it down. Let me pull up where I wrote it down because there was a few of them this week. Uh, the lockup expiration for Chewy. Oh man, 
I think you told us it was either today or tomorrow. I can't remember the date. Why can't? Thank you. Here we go. Um, Chewy is, is December 11th. Chewy's tomorrow. Tomorrow. So okay. the, the lockups we had yesterday were CrowdStrike and yep. Mohawk. Today is Fiverr. F-V-R-R. Okay. Tomorrow yep. is Chewy. Today's Fiverr. Tomorrow's Chewy. Who did we have yesterday? Uh, Mohawk, MWK, and CrowdStrike. Yep. And MW- MWK was very weak yesterday, and CrowdStrike CRWD was weak as well. So, you know, these ev- they just work. You did know, they, some of these things just work very, very well. Did they, did they uh, reorg? Hasn't Mohawk been around for a long time? No, you talk Mohawk Industries, MHK. That's completely different, Joel. That's Kerpus. Okay. Well, how can they do this? I know why, why they have two, why they want to call it Mohawk. We don't need more Mohawks, but <laughs> that's Mohawk Industries. Uh, okay, I'm wrong. All right. So yeah, it's completely t- different company. All right. This um, is Mo. I don't know what this Mohawk does. What does this other Mohawk do? What's the symbol on that other Mohawk again? Um, the, the the new one, MWK. MWK. Yeah. Do we know what they do? Uh, let me find out for you. They're in electronics. They do uh, home and kitchen appliances. And the other one's a utility, right? No, Mo- I just said it. It's flooring. Flooring. Okay. Yeah, because I trade it with sometimes they sometimes will move with the housing stocks. Even. How do you? Oh, okay, that answers my question. I was gonna say, how, how do you retain all the like what company? Like, there's no way you're trading and you're like, oh, I wonder what this company does. But no, you're you're trading them. I've tra- the the one advantage that I have is just screen time. So you know, for the most part, I've traded for tw- I've traded for twenty years, you know, full time. So if a company's been out there for more than a year or two. There's probably a decent possibility, as long as it's not some small cap. If it trades some volume, there's probably a decent poss- decent probability. I probably know what they do, at least. You know, at the bottom line, I know what industry they're in. So, you know, and that's where I look at Mohawk, and I'm like, that's a flooring company. So you think that kind of does tie into the house- home builders to a certain extent. Now, I don't necessarily go, I'm going to short Mohawk <laughs> by DHI, no. but I know there is a loose relationship there, and I love my relationships. So... Um, just like, you know, with some of the, you know, you can even go and look at, you know, shingle companies, you can look at different things. There's loose relationships there. I mean, and flooring goes into houses. So houses you know, are doing really well. Sometimes it's good for Mohawk. So, and if you bring them up and you look at the charts of DHI or you look at, you know, even within the industry, they all kind of look different, but there's a loose relationship there that needs to be respected. Uh, Lombardo 141 says, uh, that's why you're no good at hot potato because there's no more space in your brain. From knowing all these facts. <laughs> it's all retaining useless facts. <laughs> Useful facts to me. I, I just like, I've always been like, what do they say? You know, jack of all trades, master of none. Yep. I'm kind of like jack of no trades, master of one. I'm Griffin good at trading. La- <laughs> I'm good at nothing else. <laughs> Griffin Eleven throwing a tough question here at me. I'll see if I can tackle it. Joel, can you talk about the market closing the gap? And now rallying on better cha- that must have been chain uh, store sales numbers ahead of the 830 numbers. Uh, what I think he's referring to was going down to Friday's low, and we basically filled the gap at Friday's low. Uh, we did talk about a little a little strength in retail, so you did get a little pop off that. So, yeah, I mean, if you wanted a reset, if you were bullish this market before the unemployment number, and you didn't buy that Thursday night open. You got to reset that at 16 and a quarter. Uh, the low on that day, the Globex low was 17. So that's a big, big level to hold today, you know, for us just to go out and, you know, to make another run at that 3158 area. So I'm looking at that. And then on the upside, um, if that holds and you can, you know, get through the close and, you know, take out the pre, I think it would be a good day for the market just to close green, you know, after starting with this kind of momentum, holding Friday's low. So, can't relate it all to like to the retail sales and everything, but just looking at my numbers, I'm just saying that's a, a big, big level on the downside, and we got to get green on the session. We did mention home builders briefly. We might as well talk toll. And this, th- these reports, I'm telling you, even if you're Every an time. insider, you can never tell which way they're going to go because I had a buddy trading like and he was just like after the report, he's like, man, I should have bought that toll. I could have bought it right after the headline okay, number because okay. the headline number came out just after four. And it kind of sat there trying to decide which way. It was a pretty good beat. And I'm like, I've seen these housing stocks 
kill the numbers and sell off. I mean, they're so impossible to call which way they're going to go. And the Toll Brothers were good, and it did rally. And you know what ended up happening? It turns it around and sells bad. off. They're so unpredictable. The most unpredictable stocks to trade on a headline number. That's what I'll say. Very unpredictable. If so you- anyways, give us the number, and we'll break down the after-hours action. It was a beat and a beat, like you said. EPS a buck forty one versus a buck thirty. Sales two point three eight versus two point one nine billion dollars. So strong, not just like weak beats, but strong beats. Good beats. So you'd think like that's gonna rally. I I could have lifted it too. Forty one forty two, and everybody's been you know every trader that trades these things has been burned before by lifting offers on a on a home builder that's beat. So I'm like, no, this is no touch for me. I could buy it a forty one sixty all day. Um, like it was, there was, start, it was stock available, like a, almost a minute after the report. And I'm like, eh. I, even though it's a beat beat, I've seen this do some funny things before. Anyway, it rallies all the way up. So I had, you know, non-buyer's remorse, you could call it. I wish I would have lifted it right off the bat because I went up oh, going up over 40, almost 43 dollars. And you know I what? A, I got a print over 43. Got I, over 43. So it would have worked out. But if you if you were able to get out, and then it turned around, they just started yeah. leaking and leaking, leaking, and you know, and and we're talking like ten minutes, and by fifteen twenty minutes later, the thing gone red. So unpredictable. Like, how did we know the path was going to look like that? How do you know it just didn't start going down? That's why I didn't buy it on the headline number. Sometimes the algos, I think the algos are even spooked on this one because nobody bought on the headline number. The algos often buy a beat beat. And they were even spooked on toll. They weren't coming in and buying it right there because they've probably been burned on it before. The home builders are very hard to trade on headline numbers. I know that from experience. All right. I will give you a setup here for Toll Brothers after its nice rally. It's popping, it's drop. It's opening right into uh, Friday, Monday lows. And we're actually just trading, you know, at that area right now. So you'll you'll give yourself if if you're so inclined to be bullish to stock, you got 4072, 4084 to lean on. And then boom, and that holds that. Go up and use the close as resistance at 4142. Uh, I wouldn't give it all the way down to 40 bucks. You're three days We're ripping low. higher yeah. here right now, too. Yeah, we are you rip- cannot keep this market down, it seems like. You think, you think, oh, yeah, here we go. You know, we're going to get a little bit of a sell-off here. And what do they do? They just rip it again. I wonder what's uh, – well, Pelosi's supposed to speak at 10. I'm not sure what anticipation the market's going to have on that. But uh, can we look at uh, a disaster, Con, C-O-N-N, for our disaster traders? Yeah, this one is off earnings this morning. So their earnings, uh, the EPS beat uh, and the sales missed, uh, but they guided that uh, total retail sales uh, for the current quarter, Q4, will be down 5 to 9% on a year-over-year basis. Hmm. Just, I'm in a fast market. Here, go. Go. Uh, pre-market low is what, 14, 16? It got all the way down to, so that is a major low. You've bounced off it. I think you go back to that area, may get some back and fill, uh, but this is a multi, multi-year low. You got to go back to uh, 840 is not going to do any good. Uh, see what happens if, if it goes back down to the pre-market low, see if it can hold. Uh, since you hit that pre-market low, you're really at the top of the rebound at 15 Point thirty six uh, S and P's are now only down three and a quarter handles, three and a half handles, itching towards that closing price thirty one thirty four fifty. So a lot of people would like to see that, uh, and the pre market high thirty one thirty eight seventy five. So getting some pretty good trading action here. Uh, during the show, that's very, very nice of them. So, Spencer, uh, yeah, might as well just run through the rest of the earnings reports sure. we've got. Uh, let's do HC Supply, HDS here reporting this morning a Q3 adjusted EPS beat a dollar one cent versus 99 cents. Sales 1.64 billion is, is essentially in line. It was a slight beat on that. Uh, they gave some guidance as well for the current quarter. EPS guidance was in line, sales guidance was in line, guidance for the fiscal year was uh, also in line. I'm, I'm not going to even uh, mess with that pre-market low because it was just a spike down and it came right back. But for you uh, HDS bulls, you want to see 4050 taken out today. That's the area of three highs from the end of November, uh, 41, 40, 45, 40, 30. 
that's your resistance. And then boom, even if you get through that, you got another triple top at 4075, 4080. So this stock has got some work to do on the upside here, only trading down two cents. Uh, the pre-market low, someone slammed it down on that. I'm not going to give you that 3890. Uh, what's yesterday's low? Yesterday's low was 30, 38, 39.86. So Keep an eye on that for more downside here. HDS, not stock I'm all that familiar with. Um, let's go to the cloud, Mongo uh, DB, MDB. MDB. They reported after the close yesterday as well. Yowzer. Q3 adjusted EPS. They lost 26 cents. That's two cents better than expected. So that's good, I guess. Sales 109 versus $99 million. So good mm. Q3 numbers, at least good 3Q uh, headline numbers. Guidance that they gave, Q4 EPS guidance was better by a few cents. Sales guidance better by a few million dollars. Same story for the fiscal year guidance. Uh, next target, if you're looking for more on this, what was the uh, what was the after hours high? The uh, after hours high was way up at 143.90, but I would be more inclined to look at 142.49. You're still two bucks away from that. That was your four day high and actually. Uh, yeah, one one forty two forty nine. Another high at one forty three sixteen. So let's split those one forty two seventy five. Your super extra major resistance is up at the one fifty area. You had three highs in that area back at the end of November, and then a very important level to hold here one thirty. And I know we're kind of in the middle of those two areas, but uh, several lows at uh, one thirty to one thirty one. Nine bucks away. That was a close from yesterday. That'll be your major support moving forward. I want to look at the retailers. I don't. I was just off the grid here for a minute. I don't think okay. you talked them yet. Correct? No, we actually. I meant to, but we haven't gone around to it. So let's do Get it. Get to Macy's because this was very interesting from yesterday. So we've seen this happen before. We get a major downgrade in the stock, and they just. And obviously, the stocks always usually open down on that. But they turned around. They bought that thing all day. We talked about this fourteen being critical yeah. support. It held once again. That was. Um, an incredible, impressive, impressive showing by Macy's in the face of a GS downgrade to sell. So with that being said, I think you have some people caught short here now, and I would not be surprised if you even got set up for a two day move here. I think by, I think actually Macy's um, for a trade sets up not bad leaning again on 14. I don't know if I want to buy the 15 and a half, but if we were to pull in a little bit here this morning with the market weakness and what, what market weakness, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I might as well just cancel green, all my orders. What is going on here, folks? I, I'm canceling everything. GD productivity revised. Uh, it's markets. Uh, whoa, I just, I just, what the hell was that? Just now. We are, Dennis, this is you said. Holy we're, cow. We're not moving on the numbers. We're moving on the numbers, folks. That uh, wasn't a number, was it? What? Uh, what was, oh my God, what was labor that? labor costs, breaking news. No. Uh, that's not breaking news. Non-farm productivity? That's not going to move it like that. It sure is. Ben. Somebody said something Favorite because call? that was an 830. It's 833. That started moving at 832. They come up with 832 numbers now. Is that I, what they do? I, I don't know. Do they come up with 832 numbers now? Let me see if I've seen anything. What? That here. was a man. Was that a candle? Whew. Yeah, I know. I, well, I get my face ripped off on that. So I'm like, felt, 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 felt. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah, well, you got to get out. You got to. It's hard. It's it's sometimes you know. Obviously, you know, I play. You know, and obviously, I'm trading a lot of different stocks. I trade stock. I try not to trade stocks we're talking about, but you know, I'm just out there and I've got positions overnight. I'm trying to work out of those. The market's down significantly. There, you're trying to work out of stocks. You know that that you know are, are more flat. Yeah, and when the market just Trump rips tweet, ten points Trump tweet, on no uh, new on on no scheduled headline, I have a Trump. I bet you uh, we got. Um, Trump China deal. Uh, Trump tweets. No, we, uh, he hasn't tweeted. Tariffs delay. China deal close. Are you sure? Are you I'm on, I'm on his Twitter page. He has not tweeted. Somebody yeah. said something. Uh, unless my I no, didn't my, move on Q3 productivity. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. There's no way. Somebody said something. I know uh, CNBC's pop and Q3 productivity. Oh, look at the S and P's that come all the way back on that. I highly doubt that that moved on Q3 productivity. Like so, that. someone, someone somewhere is saying that there's going to be possible tariff delays. I, I still, yeah. so CNBC I don't know who that is all over the, the news that isn't impacting well, the market. You, 
I'm, I'm not sure who this person is that's that's saying productivity delays or, or, or tariff delays. Excuse me. Um, um, Bloomberg. It's it's from Dow. I see it from Dow Jones, but I don't. Uh, so the headline is that they're de- they're going to delay the December tariffs. We talked about this on the pre pre market show. Actually, the we're only five days away, folks. Five days away from this tariff deadline. So I guess they talked about delaying that tar- moving pushing back that tariff deadline here, but. I was just saying to Dennis this morning, I haven't heard Jack about what's going to happen ahead of this uh, of this deadline here. We haven't heard, heard anything about whether they're going to they're going to push it back or whether this is going to actually happen or what. This U.S. Is a- this is Christian from Hertz, U.S. and Chinese trade negotiators planning for delay of December tariffs. There's your head. Oh, there Thanks, we go. Christian. I, I Thanks, follow, Christian. I, I mean, follow, this, this is one. This is one report. This is one report. From, I follow Christian. I don't see that. This is one report from one. That's your headline. So forget about people talking. Oh, it was that eight thirty number. It was not the eight thirty number. This is your headline. Christian went all over it. U.S. and Chinese it's, trade it's from, negotiators yeah, sure. planning for delay of December tariffs. Yeah, it's, it's I don't from, know. That's probably from Bloomberg because no, um, it's he's not. Tweeting. It's from it's from Dow Jones. It's from Dow Jones. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So there you go. That's your wow. that's your catalyst. Okay. Well, on that note, <laughs> let's bring on our guest today uh, and talk about something other than trade for once. I'm going to bring him on now. Eric Kroll he is the uh, founder of Kroll Asset Management. He's also the co-author of the Life Cycle Trade. Uh, going to give do a little year in review in IPO and Eric. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Pushing away. Pushing aside that talk of trade tariff and, and delays, Eric. Uh, let, let's talk about IPOs here. We, we discussed briefly earlier. We've got some big lockup expirations happening this week. Um, what what should we remember most uh, about the year in IPOs in 2019? Well, I think this was the year of the uh, anticipation for great IPOs for uh, big companies like Lyft and Uber and Pinterest and Peloton and things like that. But that uh, although a lot of people were disappointed in the behavior of the stocks, they actually acted pretty normal. Uh, this is how most IPOs go. Uh, I think this year, this year they just got more uh, press and, and there was more anticipation. But really, um, they acted pretty much the way they always do. Most of them don't do very well for, at the very beginning. Uh, many of them end up forming some sort of base and then breaking out and doing better later on. But for the most part, when they first come out, uh, they do not uh, post large gains very fast at all. So all these laggards, all these underperforming IPOs, right? Uber, Lyft, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do we know that this that this isn't normal? Like you're saying it's normal behavior, but how do we know this is actually the result of massively overvalued private companies? Um, well, in general, from the studies we've done over the past uh, 45 years, back to 1987, we uh, more than 45 years, it just turns out that that's just how stocks go. They, they have a lot of, um, I guess, um, valuation growth prior to the IPO phase. And then the initial investors, they get out and uh, the, the stock doesn't do well for a while. And then it starts to come back typically uh, maybe 15 to 12, uh, 12 to 18 months later. And then uh, the stocks can form uh, and maybe in advance after a long institutional due diligence phase and then run from there. So, But in this case, I think a lot of these uh, we'll call them the unicorns, the ones that had over a billion dollar valuation uh, prior to going public. This is like a more new phenomenon, like in the last five years, where companies wait and delay before they go public. And you see these, you know, uh, venture capitalists uh, funding rounds go higher and higher at crazy valuations, like on WeWork and other stocks like that, where it eventually they just get to the point where they are overvaluated before they come to the public. So um, it's a little bit more recent phenomenon where they, the prices and the valuations go sky high before they go public. But it's, it's not unusual for stocks, once they go public, to not do very well. And you were kind enough to send over some graphics here. I've got a chart up right now. Uh, the majority of uh, 2019 IPOs have, have uh, posted losses this year, and only 8%, you say, have uh, posted gains of at least 40%. I mean, that's a pretty big number, 40%. But... Right. Well, when most people want to invest in an IPO uh, because they think they're going to get some gains fast. So when we look at things, we want to see how many have, you know posted fast gains and not that many. You're only looking at 13 out of the 164 um, currently are at a point where they're above 40%, you know, 40% above or more of where their day one close was. 
And you can see from that chart that the vast majority are at losses, almost two thirds, and then only an additional 25% have some smaller gains, and then only 8% have big gains. I mean, people get excited. There's a lot of um, you know, um, anticipation for a stock to IPO, and people think they have to get in right away. They want to have the next Amazon. And what happens, of course, is that not many post very fast gains. Some have, and some post gains, and then uh, go up pretty quickly in the IPO advance phase, and then quickly give them back. So looking at this list of the best performing IPOs of the year, trying to find some sort of common trade, obviously I look at the top four, I see uh, biotech, um, but what what do these names have in common, if anything, or is there any commonality that you can observe? Uh, you're right about the part about biotechs and biotechs are kind of a hit or miss. When you look at some of those ones in the top four there, you look at KRTX and NextCure, if you were to actually pull up those charts, you would see that those had like quick one day wonder moves or two or three day wonders. And then they start to pull back pretty sharply. And so uh, those are not things that I think you can really anticipate or, or count on. I'd, I'd be more interested in the stocks that are uh, further down the list, like INMD, uh, Progeny, uh, Luck and Coffee and Peloton, where those are currently in IPO advanced uh, phases where they're running up, maybe they've run uh, in the IPO advanced phase isn't even over yet. But with some fast trading, you might be able to make some gains in those stocks because it looks like they're still in the move, uh, middle of an IPO advance. KRTX and NXTC, if you weren't in those before they some announcement came out, you pretty much missed it. I'm not sure those um, would be investable now. I mean, you'd have to look for some sort of um, sideways action and maybe a, a base formation before you could... Uh, and a breakout before you'd invest in those again. Uh, but some of the other ones, like you look at uh, Trade Web, Grocery Outlet, and Beyond Meat, they already had their IPO advance and they're on the decline. Um, you'd have to wait a, a pretty long time for those to set up again uh, before you could buy those. Um, that IPO advance phase is fast. Sometimes you can make good gains, but you better have fast rules because it doesn't last long. I see an interesting name on this list here, Peloton. And Joel, yeah. you forgot to tell us yesterday your Breaking news. news. Did this make it on Benzinga Pro or know, not? I don't know if it did. Eric, are you sitting down? I'm sitting down. Uh, my wife and I purchased a, a Peloton on Saturday. Look at you, Joel. You've got your Apple Watch, your Peloton. I, I know. Joel is a regular I, 21st yeah, I, century savant. So I, I, for full disclosure, I do not own the stock yet, but uh, he's about to. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking about it here. I mean, there's uh, so talk about it, you know, in the uh, IPO stage here because it got hit. I mean, I see a lot of technical points where I would have bought it, but now I'm like, oh, yoy, what, am, you know. Where you know it's probably still trading at a high valuation. Yeah. Uh, so where where are we at in the cycle, and am I going to get a, a a nice flush in here and get an opportunity to get into the cheap, or should I just plug my nose and buy it here? Well, that, that's an interesting question because when you look at the chart there, you can see like the day one range, and then it went cut below it, cut undercut the day one range, kind of went sideways for a while, and then yep. you can see. When it broke out above that day one range, that would have been a, a good buy. That was buy. huge. I see that. Yep. And yep. then it, now it's in the IPO advance phase. And you can see it's kind of looks like maybe a short-term peak, maybe some climactic top action. But sometimes in this IPO advance phase, they'll do some, what looks like a climax top beyond meat, beyond meat to this a couple of times. And then it starts to advance again. So it'd be a little bit risky to buy here. But if it could go sideways for a day or two, uh, some more days or a week or two, and then if it broke to a new high, that would be a good place to buy. But you're okay. right. I feel like if you bought here, you're at risk of maybe start, maybe it corrects quickly and quickly undercuts that low of just a few days ago. It, All right. It, they're, I, I, they're I'm, really I'm, volatile at this stage. Oh, I know. I know. I see that. And because Dennis and I, man, we focused on opening prices ah, forever. And I'm looking at that opening and, uh, you know, the initial IPO opening. The reason I bought it is it's not going to be like my main uh, workout thing. I like to swim. I like to do some weight. I like to do a lot of stuff. But uh, my wife, you know, she gets to swim a couple times a week and the weekend on Wednesdays. But, you know, she doesn't have time to get to the gym early in the morning. And uh, boom, you can hop on that thing for a 20 minute workout. I'll, I'll use it a couple times a week. 
also hang some laundry on it here. Right. And uh, also they offer other programs too. Like you could, you could to, you know, put on your, your tube and get yoga and different exercises. So, I mean, I'd suck. It's good for your health. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't know like where it's trading and the valuation and everything, but you know, not expensive. They don't make you pay for the whole bike. I even got the nice Peloton shoes. I'll bring them in someday. Yeah, you got to have Peloton shoes to, to fit on the can, bike. Can you even use the bike without the Peloton shoes? Yeah, at least it was like, oh, I'm going to look online and get them cheaper. I'm like, just get the Peloton shoes. Don't <laughs> worry about you, ordering Jack. stuff online. So, yeah, that was a big Christmas uh, holiday Hanukkah purchase, the, the Peloton. Spencer, you want to come over when it gets delivered? Oh, sure, We, we can set up a profile for you. Too. Oh, that's great. You can just work great. out on that. Uh, I, I want to get back to some IPOs that, that besides Peloton here. So, uh, Eric, you, you've got some ideas for us for recent IPOs that may have completed their institutional due diligence phase. Now, the term recent, obviously a uh, subjective term here, but there a couple of charts here that you you, 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 you sent over to us. Uh, Spotify, Redfin, and DocuSign, all of IPO in the last year, year and a half or so. And right. talk, talk us through what, or I guess two years in the case of Redfin, but uh, talk us through what phases these names are in right now. Okay. As you can see in the chart in the upper uh, left corner, uh, that's the life cycle phase uh, pattern that we've uh, looked at in our research, where you can see in the beginning, you know, there's, an I, there's the IPO price at the very far left. There's usually an IPO advance of some sort. And then it starts to go sideways and correct for a long time. And then after it, the stock starts to advance again, it usually runs into trouble in that turbulent zone right about where it either had a prior peak or in the case of stocks that fall right away, it right around the, their IPO day one range, it starts to come into like some turbulence. And then it starts to advance. And so we call that long sideways phase, the institutional due diligence phase. And you want to get a stock after it emerges from that. So if you look at Spotify, you can see it had an IPO advance and then it started to correct. It came all the way down and undercut their day one range, started to bounce around a little bit, and it's been going sideways and correct, you know, uh, consolidating. And what we're looking at now is it's bouncing off the bottom. And what we'd like to see is that stock continue to advance and break above the most recent high there, that little uh, bump in the middle. And then maybe that's the beginning of an IPO advance phase. Uh, um, I mean, the um, um, after the institutional due diligence phase, the institutional advance. And my fear is this stock could rise a little bit and start bouncing around at the old high, and that would be the turbulent zone, and you want to see it break above that. Redfin obviously did not have an IPO advance phase. It just kind of bounced around, was pretty volatile, and it's been kind of going sideways. It's hit a bottom and then uh, bounced up and came back down, but it has a lower I mean, it's a higher low. And so you're looking at potentially, maybe it starts to advance and it starts to uh, finish its institutional due diligence phase and it goes on to um, institutional advance phase. DocuSign had a quick IPO advance, came down, undercut the low of the day one range, started to bounce around, formed a little base, broke out, and now it is advancing. I would say DocuSign is potentially in an institutional advance phase. Um, it would be a shorter than normal uh, institutional due diligence phase, but sometimes stocks do that. I mean, this would be a stock that maybe has some potential. So you're obviously, you're not saying that these stocks are going to go up now because they've, they've no. had this period of consolidation. So how would you then approach this? If let's say you were interested, how would you approach this? Well, you're right. You can never say they're going to go up for sure, but they're showing patterns consistent with once the stock, like let's say in the case of Redfin and Spotify, they have not broken out yet. Um, if they do break out in heavy volume, I would say it's consistent with what past good performers have done, where they do this long sideways action, form a base on the breakout, and they have the potential to go up further. So what I would do is like a case of Redfin or Spotify, I'd put an alert out on a price above an old high, like a more recent high, and see when get an alert when it breaks out. See if it's heavy volume, and maybe take a small position, and then reward that position if it continues to advance by buying more. Um, in the case of DocuSign, it looks like you uh, potentially have already missed that breakout. I would be looking for some sideways action where maybe it's tight for three weeks, 
Uh, maybe it comes back down to like the 50 day moving average and then look for an advance from there in heavy volume. But um, you have to set alerts and then look for a breakout in high volume and potentially buy from there. But there's no guarantees. Uh, but it looks like they're forming the type of patterns consistent with past big winners. And just for fun here, we're looking at the worst performing IPOs of the year. <laughs> Smile Direct Club, Revolve Group, Lyft, uh, Slack, just uh, Uber, Chewy, which we discussed this morning off earnings, just to name a few. Any of these names that you like, just objectively speaking, Eric, or just the company or the, or the product or, or no? Well, for, uh, for my for my money, I would say um, long term, I'm not interested in buying them at all right now. Um, I'd be interested in maybe something like uh, Lyft or Uber, where they they came out uh, in the public domain. They immediately fell. They've been they've been falling. They need probably another good six months of, of sideways action. If they can form a base at the bottom and start to show profitability, then I'd be interested. I I want to see the the losses uh, go down. I want to see profitability. Um, maybe Slack Slack um, has the potential there too, but. I, I'm not interested in any of these right now at all. Um, and I'll take credit for killing Smile Direct Club because I think the last time you had me on the show, that was the day that one went public. And I said, it, it been. Didn't look like a good one. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, all right. We've been on the line with Eric Kroll. He is the uh, founder of Kroll Asset Management, also co author of The Life Cycle Trade. Eric, thank you so much for the time this morning. And if we don't talk to you, have a great rest and, of the uh, year. And yes. our most prepared guest. Most definitely uh, the most, most prepared uh, guest. You are the most prepared guest of 2019, <laughs> Eric. Oh. Thank you. you well, we will send you a T-shirt, a Bazinga, Bazinga T-shirt for that. The, the, the T-shirt would be great. I'll hang it on a Peloton over here. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, Eric. All right, thanks. Have a great day. <laughs> That was a good one. That was very good. That, that was, was very quick. Okay. Uh, we unfortunately, I think we have lost Dennis for the day. Let's see if we can get it back. Dennis's computer is doing a Windows update. I think. Oh, no. I, I think right now. Wait, Dennis, I think you might be back. Dennis, are you here? Oh, he is. <laughs> we got him back. I'm back. I might as well just uh, talk. Cause, uh, so, anyways, I had an internet flicker. So um, that's why I was lost there for a little bit. So I rebooted my modem. And well, all of a sudden, you know, I've, I'm rebooting my trading computing computer too on this Flickr, and Windows all of a sudden says, "Oh, hey, we get a reboot here, so we might as well do some uh, updates for you right now." They don't give you a choice, so they just hijacked my trading computer, and we're doing Windows updates now on my trading computer. Thank you very much, Microsoft. It'd been nice if you say, "Do you want to do updates?" Oh no, you get a reboot; you just automatically do updates. So I didn't permission give a permission for that. So right now I can't trade because Windows has decided to do um, updates. I guess I could go download my other trading software on another PC, but uh, anyways, we, we, I've complained about this before. The Windows hijacking of Windows updates. So it. I don't it's not even do doing it. It's just getting Windows ready to do updates. <laughs> so maybe I'm not even going to be able to trade the open here at this rate. So you can tell I love my. Why don't you um? Why don't you call in your orders? I like the old days. So I have no information. Um, so I'm kind of blind, blind here too, other than. Wait, but do you want some, wait, wait, but do you have like open so orders? You guys are my information source here. Do you want right some now. quotes? Wait, do you have open <laughs> orders? I hope you don't have anything open. Of course I, well, no, I can't. I actually don't because I canceled everything when I got okay. picked off on, yes. on all those things when we ripped higher there. So you right. these ripping hires and you're doing a lot of live radio show. It's never a good combination. <laughs> yeah. Do you want us to read you some quotes? We can do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no idea what my computer is doing. It says, don't. So all I have is a little flashing pinwheel. It says, getting windows ready. Don't turn off your computer. Oh. Should I turn off my computer? <laughs> oh my God. God. Yeah, should I turn off the computer? Because I want to trade the open. I have 37 minutes here. Uh, that, that won't help. It Am I going to get, is it going to do anything? It's just spinning. That won't help. I, Get, uh, getting uh, windows ready. Don't turn off your computer. Um, I have no advice for you on that. I missed all Eric's interview too, and I love Eric, and I miss that too. So the good news is it's taped, so I get to watch Eric afterwards. So Eric, if you're still listening, love you. Wish I would have been on the interview, but I had the internet outage right as you came on. Oh uh, someone is. What uh, a morning for who, Dennis. Who, oh, it's been it's been a it's been an awesome morning, and both kids have the flu still. Uh, days. I'm buying the Dennis calls. Uh, I'll buy the Dennis puts week. right I'll now. Buy the puts. I'll buy the puts. I'll buy the puts through Friday. And then I'll buy the puts for this week. Yeah. And then I'll buy, buy the puts. Why the short term puts? Uh, someone asked <laughs> about uh, Microsoft here. I mean, the beast, the stock goes up all the time, every day almost. Had a little bit of a decline last week. 
It looks like someone's working a piece at the 152 area, the best I could tell. You had a high Friday, 151.87, high yesterday, 152.21. Such as if someone's trying to wiggle out of, you know, half a million shares or so at 152. I would keep an eye on that. The all-time closing high, let's see what the all-time closing high is right in this area too, at 152.03. So someone right now, no, 152.32. So there you go. That 152 just looks like a little pesky today. If you get a rip roaring market, shouldn't have any problems with it. Close above that 152.32. Uh, the all time high is right up there too, 152 and a half. A lot of 152s for for Microsoft. Uh, Can you tell, talk about the NLOK. No, I was no, I was going to say no. there's there a few headlines we didn't yet get to. I want to go to the Agilent headline first, but we'll get to NL, NLOK as well. Um, Pershing Square has a $246 million stake in Agilent. They bought uh, about 2.9 million shares. They were in. I'll tell you, man, when Ackman buys something, he moves some stocks more than Warren sometimes now. Yeah. Look at this move on this headline, Joel. Where did it, it so close went off the board in the 81 handle. On this headline that Ackman bought a position, where did it get to? Uh, 87 bucks, I believe. Like, are you kidding me? It's worth 9% more because Ackman bought some shares? Is this what this market has come down to? Ackman's hot. He is hot. I'll give him that, but come on. It's worth 8 9% more, you're telling me, because Ackman's in? And obviously the people who bought it, it's now at 83, so they were dead wrong. I mean, these algos, we talk about these news algos all the time, and they're just crazy. Like, after hours is thin. I'll just lift any offer. Somebody's lifting that thing at 87 and went off the board in the 81 handle because Ackman bought some shares. 82 handle you left sounds pretty good. 83, maybe. 84, 85, 86, 87. You guys are getting carried away, you news algos. Uh, I'm trading 400,000 shares on that bracket, too, so the people were not, uh, were not messing around. But wasn't he already in this one? I would think not if it moved like that. Are you sure? I thought he was poking around in Agilent. The, the market obviously didn't think so. It wouldn't have been up that much. Here. On an ad, like when you're just adding to a position, they don't move like that. Okay. No, he was not in Agilent. Okay. No. New positions, they move. So Warren obviously I'll, always I'll, moves. I'll read, you, I'll read you his positions if you want. He's got a very small portfolio. Sure. Uh, so Agilent is a new one, but he's also got Chipotle, QSR, Hilton Worldwide, Lowe's, LOW, Berkshire, Starbucks, and Howard Hughes. Those are the that's that's it for the. Can we throw that Kramer and ask if he's diversified? <laughs> and if you watch Mad Money, no. Kramer does that. Am I diversified? Yeah. Hey, Dennis, Hi, you- I'm Bill Ackman, and this is my portfolio. Am I diversified? Kramer would be like, well, you got some overlap in this sector here, but <laughs> <Who cares? laughs> I love the Chipotle. <laughs> you went to head fund. Who cares? Hey, Dennis, <laughs> people are saying you can disable your Microsoft updates. Well, I, I think I have, but I think it just hijacked this one. I, it's probably why it's got to do a bazillion updates here now because you don't do the <laughs> I never allow it. <laughs> it's still spinning and saying getting Windows ready. Uh, it's not ready yet. Yeah. So it's been 10 minutes spinning now. I'm going to have to. It says don't turn off your computer. Is my computer going to blow up if I turn if it off? If you do, remember when we used to. I'm going to have to turn it off because I'm telling uh, you, uh, if it doesn't start doing something within the next five minutes, I'm not missing the open. So I'm going to have to turn this off. Do you remember Is it my computer going to die because of it? I used to I'm get, asking the chat. Remember when I it says it doesn't say please don't turn off your computer or we advise you not to turn off your computer. It says don't turn off your computer. I'm gonna do the don't. Is that okay? If people are saying don't do it, remember when I used to work on the computers at Bright and we would end up with like the blue screen of death. That's you what this that? is. You got the blue screen of death. It looks like well, it doesn't say you know the system you know is this. Oh, you know he does not have the. Blue. It's a blue <laughs> screen right now. Doesn't have want to see does. here. I got the camera. Look, I'm gonna take the camera. I'm gonna show you what I'm looking no, no, no. at. Oh, here we go. Wait, sh- can you share, see? Share your screen. Share your screen. Turn this camera. <laughs> can you see? Yes. This is my trading computer. This is where I make all my money. This is what it's doing right now. Th- 20, 32 minutes before the open. Oh my god. It's goodness. been doing this for 10 minutes. Do I shut off my computer? Yes or no? Ask. Asks if one person in the chat says it's okay, I'm no, gonna do Echo, it. No, Echo Graham says don't do it. Don't, don't do don't it. Do it. <laughs> well, what am I gonna do? I gotta go download. I quickly download my other software on my other trading computers. 
This is what I'm looking for. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you, Dennis. I'm sorry. Jethro. They all say don't do it. Danny Jack Johnson, Mike TV. Not one person says do it. No one is saying. I'm going to do it. No, Dennis. Okay, you know what? Dion. It's your own fault. Michael. (laughs) Oh, well, I got to trade the open. I have positions on. Download the Interactive Brokers Lite app. <laughs> well, I can download. It says on ready. I can go download ready on another Robert computer. Says no. uh, you know what I think you should do? I think you should call. How the, long does it keep spinning? <laughs> but my Apple says you stuck. Laptop. Do, you, do you even have a laptop, Dennis? No, we don't. No, I don't have a laptop. I have an iPad. Oh my gosh. Right, look, well, look at my office. I'll look over here. Yeah, there's CNBC. <laughs> that sits up over there. And there's my other computer. And this is where the show is over here. I got the nice little Wall Street thing over here. This is what inspires me. <laughs> oh, I took that man. from the old Bright office. I've never even <laughs> seen it. Thanks, Bob Bright. We're showing the competition. We're probably getting okay. trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, one more thing. We didn't even get to the, the Norwegian. The blue spin wall. wheel of death. Okay. Anyways, I'm putting it back. All right. I think I'm. Hang on. Just I I just want to say before we go, but Norton oh, Nord, Block getting getting the bid this morning off of uh, news that uh, the company has attracted interest from uh, private equity firms and and McAfee as well for a potential take. What's the What's the symbol? N L O K. Are they the one paying the five buck dividend? You know, you asked that a I, couple I, I hours ago. I have no idea. Never bothered to. I I look it up, Joel, but my spin wheel here. <laughs> Yeah, wait. Let's see if we can pull it up here. I might as well go start downloading ready on my other computer because it looks like this computer is not going to be ready for the open. Dennis, why don't you call Microsoft? Going to ready. (laughs) Downloading ready on the other computer. Okay. All right. Times. Well, I think I think we've exhausted. On that note, ourselves. I'm in a great mood. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Microsoft, for ruining my day. Thanks to Microsoft for ruining Dennis's day. Thanks to Eric Kroll for joining us today. Thanks to everyone in our chat. Both chats. I know the premarket.benzinga.com page was not working today, but we'll get it working for tomorrow. The YouTube is working just fine, so you can always find us on youtube.com slash Benzinga TV, regardless of whether the show is up on the premarket uh, page or not. You can also catch your podcast available wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, etc., etc. Please remember all the information from our show meant to be used as informational purposes only, not for investing, trading, or IT advice. Yeah. Everyone has- <laughs> Eric Eric, uh, Eric Cineroni says this is the best segment ever on the show. <laughs> that is- I've, I've actually I'm, just I'm started somebody- downloading the software onto my other... Lucky you have more than one computer, right? I'm glad well. somebody thinks so. Dennis, let me know if you needed to come over and... Uh, and that support- computer will be ready two days from now. Okay. All right. Everyone have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. All right.